I used to think it couldn't get any worse. But I was so wrong. The past week at work has been an absolute nightmare, and just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, my boss, who is also the president of the company, called me into his office to scold me for a mistake that wasn't even mine. As if that wasn't enough. When I finally got home, I found that my sister-in-law's car had inconveniently blocked my driveway, and I had no choice but to look for parking three houses down. To make matters worse, the street was packed with cars of the neighbor's teenage son and his buddies. Let's talk about how to add insult to injury. As I crossed the threshold of the house, I couldn't help but wonder why I had started this in the first place. My wife's sister Susan and I have always had a peculiar relationship since we first met. I couldn't figure out why, but there was an unmistakable hostility coming from her towards me. Adding to my disappointment was the fact that my attempts to achieve intimacy with my wife, Janice, had been in vain for almost a month, despite my tireless efforts. As I walked to the kitchen, the living room was filled with the sounds of music and conversations between my wife and her sister. Opening a cold beer from the fridge, I took a quick sip and headed into the living room. But a phrase that sounded outside the door stopped me on the threshold. Words. God, he avoided me three times today. Came not from the mouth of my daughter-in-law, but from the mouth of my beloved wife. My wife confessed. Since Brandon came back last month, I've completely fallen in love with him. I was well aware of Brandon, as he was my wife's ex-boyfriend, who left her and moved to another place. Intrigued, my wife's sister asked, What are you planning now? Without hesitation, Janice replied, Brandon wants me to live with him. Therefore, I will hire a lawyer and start the divorce process. Since we live in a state with shared property, I am entitled to half of our property. By this point, I had heard more than I could bear. In a daze, I slowly backed up to the back exit and returned to my car. After opening the door, I sat down in the driver's seat, finally realizing the true reason for the lack of emotional connection. Without knowing it, my wife had shared her affection with someone else, and now she was trying to claim half of everything we owned. The most unpleasant moment was the high probability that the state would grant her request. It's only been three years since Janice and I exchanged vows. Shortly after our wedding, she unexpectedly quit her job and has rarely appeared for household chores since. Three times a week I hired a maid to clean the house and do the laundry. And on those days she also cooked dinner. The rest of the days I either cooked or ordered takeout. I understand that you may have doubts, but love made me turn a blind eye to it. She made me happy by satisfying me physically, at least until a month ago. When I was 13 years old, I experienced the heartbreaking loss of my mother, which deeply affected both my father and me. My father did his best to raise me well, and as a result, we formed a strong bond. At the age of 23, I suffered a devastating loss when he tragically died due to a drunk driver. It was a deep blow, especially considering that it happened only a year before I met Janice. Fortunately, I inherited a significant amount of money from my father, about two and a half million dollars. Instead of squandering it, I made a wise choice. I invested the inheritance with the help of a knowledgeable broker. Despite Janice's persistent attempts to shake every cent I earned out of me, I managed to accumulate hundreds of thousands of dollars in savings. It is noteworthy that I have never touched the inherited amount, which allowed it to flourish even in a difficult economy. As a result, I had enough money for a comfortable life. Thanks to Janice, I didn't have to use my money. Our deep affection for each other made us skip the idea of a prenup, which is a common mistake of many who believe that their marriage will last indefinitely. Unfortunately, this oversight meant that Janice could potentially demand a significant sum, almost one and a half million, just for the privilege of being intimate with me. It seemed that the state readily approved of this legalized form of exploitation. Janice casually mentioned hiring a lawyer, hinting that she was not ready for trial yet. Realizing that I had a chance, I realized the need to act immediately. I was sitting in the car, carefully thinking out a plan, and carefully watching the rearview mirror. Finally, 
My sister-in-law's car appeared and drove away, forcing me to start my car. After making a smooth U-turn, I returned to my house. When I entered the house, Janice was no longer in sight, and I went to the kitchen in search of solace. After opening a fresh bottle, I took a long sip, thinking about what to do next. I didn't know you were here. Hi, honey. I just got here. It's been a pretty tiring day, I replied with a warm smile, deciding to convincingly match her behavior. She mentioned that she hadn't ordered anything for dinner, feeling a little upset. Although I wanted to say that it was because she spent the whole day with her boyfriend and shared every detail with her sister, I replied, It's all right, my love. I'll just heat up the leftovers from last night's dinner. Smiling tenderly, she gave me a sweet gesture, kissing me gently on the cheek, and then announced her intention to soak in a soothing bath. I smiled back at her and nodded in agreement, acknowledging the need to get rid of the hardships of the day. When she left, I took a plate of cold fried rice, enjoying its taste and washing it down with two more beers. Throwing away the empty container, I retired to the cozy living room, sinking into a plush armchair. After getting carried away watching the channels, I eventually settled on an old movie, overcome with nostalgia. She settled down on the couch, patiently waiting for the end of the movie. When she got up from her seat, fatigue overwhelmed her, and she announced her intention to leave for the night. She thought that I did not know that her fatigue was caused not only by the film, but also by her infidelity. I assured her that I would get the news before joining her later, although my attention wasn't really focused on the movie. Instead, my thoughts were busy developing a strategy for my next actions. Realizing the limitations of the weekend, I resigned myself to the fact that on Saturday I would take care of the yard, and on Sunday I would play a game of golf with friends. Finally, the long-awaited Monday came, and I had the opportunity to start acting. I contacted my broker, who was responsible for managing my legacy fund, and asked to transfer all assets to cash. Since I held a high position in my company, I took the opportunity to withdraw funds from my 401k without fear of penalties. By Thursday, everything was settled, and I was ready to take the next step. When I arrived home, I broke the news to my supposedly loving wife, explaining that I urgently needed to fly away for a week on official business. In preparation for the trip, I packed only two suitcases, as they contained everything I needed. After settling into our new house, I carefully put away all my cherished things. Unfortunately, none of them matched her personal preferences, and I didn't want anything else. The furniture chosen exclusively by her had no meaning in my heart. Fortunately, we just rented this house, which saved me from financial dependence. Since we recently sold my condo, our current task was to find the perfect option to buy. So far, all the houses we've inspected have not met her requirements. On Friday morning, I kissed my wife affectionately goodbye and maneuvered my suitcases to the exit. After carefully packing them into my Lexus, I set off without looking back at anyone. The first destination was the residence of my longtime friend Jake, a man I trusted completely. His surprise was obvious when I offered to exchange his old but refurbished four-wheel drive car for mine. After telling him about my predicament, I set off for the West within an hour. I doubted that anyone would be able to connect me to the car that I had exchanged with Jake, and he assured me that he would hide it in his garage for a long time. For the next four days, I made all purchases exclusively in cash, canceling all our credit cards so as not to leave any traces. Most of my funds were now safely hidden in an offshore account provided by my broker. I set up a money transfer system with him when it was necessary. In order to hold out for a considerable time, I hid a sufficient amount of cash in the SUV. The most difficult moments were the nights spent alone in motels. Over the past week, I have been completely absorbed in the implementation of my plan, leaving no time for personal reflection on what happened. Janice held a special place in my heart, as evidenced by our marriage. I thought about a lot of hypothetical situations, but in the end, I came to the conclusion that I had no alternative. Even if I had known about her previous partner's reappearance, 
I doubted my ability to prevent their reunion. Two conclusions came to mind. She probably never really loved me, and I should take responsibility for my own stupidity by marrying her. On the fifth day of my absence from home, I found myself sitting in a quaint mall and diner in a small Montana town. Reflecting on the actions of my supposedly loving wife, I couldn't help but wonder what she was doing now, given the length of my absence. As I sat thinking that she had most likely just found out about her cancelled credit cards and empty bank account, my attention was distracted by an elderly couple sitting nearby. Their quiet conversation inadvertently caught my attention, and I couldn't help but listen. The man, who looked to be in his fifties, shared with his red-haired wife the desire to get additional help on their farm. Unfortunately, their financial situation did not allow them to hire anyone until their current calves were ready for sale. It turned out to be quite difficult to find a person who would agree to work within their budget. Finishing the last portion, I got up from my seat and plucked up the courage to go to their table. I apologized for accidentally overhearing their conversation, but offered my help. The elderly gentleman studied me intently, assessing my merits. I don't see how you can help, he said skeptically. If you overheard our conversation, you know that I can't pay you anything. I paused to collect my thoughts before making a suggestion. What if, in exchange for my services, I only demand a place to stay for the night? Will that suit you? I suggested, hoping to find a mutually beneficial agreement. His gaze became intense, and his eyes narrowed. Colleen, please excuse us for a moment he said to his wife. Rising from his seat, he waited patiently for me to join him. We went out to the parking lot so that our conversation would remain confidential. When he turned to face me, I quickly realized that he was the same height as me, about six feet tall, solidly built, with broad shoulders and no visible signs of excess weight. Gray streaks appeared in his once dark hair, and his weathered face bore traces of a life spent working outdoors. Excuse me, but may I know your identity? Are you connected to the Wilson Ranch? He asked, suspicion in his tone. In response, I instinctively raised my hands in a defensive manner and hurriedly added, Please wait, sir. I am completely unaware of any connection to the Wilson Ranch. As a matter of fact, I was living in Texas just four days ago and only arrived here this morning. I thought maybe we could mutually help each other. He replied, if your statement is true, then what motivation do you have to help us? I must inform you that I cannot offer any financial compensation. What will be your incentive? I don't need trouble with the law if you're involved in it, he said, acknowledging that I could be considered on the run, but not in the sense that one might assume. After describing the situation, I told about my unfaithful wife's malicious intentions to take everything away from me and about her desperate need for temporary housing. I assured them that I had not committed any crimes and had not harmed anyone. My only goal is to keep what is rightfully mine. If there is an opportunity to provide me with housing, I am ready to repay their kindness with my work and self-sufficiency. If you think I'm not providing any help, please let me know and I'll leave without any hard feelings. He studied my expression and replied, Son, if your words are honest, I think it would be unwise of me not to at least give you an opportunity, but I have to be honest with you. The Wilsons are trying to convince me to sell them my land. So far, they have not resorted to any deceptive measures, but I would not try to convince them. You may find yourself in a difficult situation. I told him I was willing to take that risk. After that, he asked about my background from the ranch, and I decided to be truthful admitting that I had spent only a few summers at my uncle's estate in Texas without being officially a cowboy. Holding out his hand, he offered a deal, and we sealed it with a handshake. He kindly insisted on being called by his first name, Bill, and I introduced myself in return. Together we returned to the diner, where Colleen was patiently waiting for us. Drawing her attention, he said, Colleen, this is Carson. He will join our team if of course he copes with the difficulties. Standing in front of me she held out her hand, which I readily accepted. Her mournful greeting was accompanied by the words, Nice to meet you Carson. 
There was a distinct tone in her voice, perhaps with an Irish accent. Like her husband, she had a slim and athletic build. I reciprocated by saying, Me too. I am also very pleased to meet you. In response, she added, You can call me Colleen, there is no need for formalities. It seems that strict etiquette was not given much importance in this region. I immediately admired his elegant companion. Bill suggested we go back to the ranch. Before leaving town, he directed us to a general store where we parked our cars and disembarked. Bill recommended that I buy clothes suitable for working on the ranch. When we entered the store, he was greeted cordially by the owner, obviously a familiar face. Forty minutes later, I bought a sufficient supply of jeans, work shirts, overcoats, and a pair of riding boots in a characteristic western style, which would last me for a week. At that time it was fine. It took about 20 miles from the local store to get to the entrance, which was decorated with the sign, Rocking Bee Ranch. This name, Rocking Bee, belonged to Bill and was associated with his brand. After driving another mile along a private road, we saw the main residence. The two-story house, located on a small hill, had a pristine appearance thanks to a well-maintained structure and a newly applied layer of paint. A barn and other buildings could be seen in the background. There were several bags of groceries in the pickup truck they were driving, indicating that they had made a weekly trip to the city to restock. I parked the car behind them, took a bunch of bags, and followed the couple into the kitchen. In two trips we managed to unload the truck. Then Bill told me to drive to the back of the lot, where he showed me a cozy house where I would live. As I drove by, I noticed that he was standing in front of the house. When I got out of the car, he gestured at the hut. He said that there was a similar house a few meters away from me. While I was unloading my things, he said that Sam was on the road now, but we would meet later. He kindly waited for me while I settled into the hut. Inside was a spacious room with a bed against one wall, a table and two chairs, a wood-burning stove tucked into the corner, and a bathroom with a modest shower. Although the hut was not extravagant, it was neat and served as a satisfactory temporary accommodation for the moment. Trying to avoid Janice's detection, I carefully climbed out and found Bill waiting for me in his pickup truck. Calling me to join him, he took me on an exciting expedition across the expanses of the ranch. This wonderful estate, covering almost 6,000 acres, had 5,000 acres of flat terrain, ideal for grazing cattle, and several hundred acres had been prudently set aside for growing fodder for the winter. As we went deeper into the ranch, the landscape turned into a picturesque panorama of rolling hills covered with lush forests, and eventually led us to majestic mountains, decorated with a meandering stream that gracefully traversed the entire estate. This place can only be reached by horseback. This man said that they used to have three full-time employees, but now, having gone through difficult times, only Sam remained. Sam has been working selflessly on the ranch for almost three decades. When it is necessary to collect cattle for selection to the market, they attract additional help. About five o'clock, he left me in a small hut. By the way, I noticed that you have a laptop. Fortunately, I have a satellite connection with a router that allows me to use the wireless internet. Dinner will be served at the main house and our usual dinner time is six o'clock. He reminded me of that before he left. After half an hour, I was comfortably settled and I had enough time to start the computer. As he said, I managed to establish a wireless connection and I quickly checked my email. Among the messages, one immediately caught my attention. Jake informed me that Janice had reported my absence to the police, who are now actively investigating my disappearance. This news made me think about a lot of things. Jake was the only person I trusted with my decision to leave, even though he didn't know where I was going. I sent my resignation letter by mail to my previous employer without bothering to personally inform him of my departure. Shortly before six o'clock, I walked up to the main residence and gently knocked on the door. Bill invited me inside, where I saw Colleen busy cooking, while Bill was chatting with a man, I thought was Sam. Bill motioned for me to join them. Hi Sam, 
Meet Carson, Bill said, smiling broadly. He's the new hand I told you about, at least for today. We'll see if he's ready for it tomorrow after work. Sam smiled warmly back and held out his hand to shake. Sam, like Bill, had an impressive height of 1 meter 85 centimeters and radiated an aura of hard work and experience. When I reached out to shake his hand, I immediately noticed the firmness of his grip. Well, young man, let's hope that you will be comfortable here, he remarked. Considering that I was only 28, he considered me young. In response, I assured him, I intend to give my best. Our conversation was interrupted by Colleen's call to join her at the table, as dinner was ready. Bill and his wife took their seats at opposite ends, leaving Sam and me sitting between them, facing each other. The table was decorated with a large plate of pork chops, a generous bowl of mashed potatoes, another filled with fresh green beans, and a plate piled high with, undoubtedly, homemade cookies. We may not indulge in fine dining, Carson, but our food is plentiful and satisfying, Colleen remarked. It really looks wonderful, I replied. While we were enjoying the meal, I asked how I was connected to this place, to which he simply replied, Yes, my grandfather laid the foundation of this ranch, and it passed to my father. In my youth, I doubted that Colleen would become a part of my life. I had to compete with every man to win her over. I watched Bill's deep love for her, which was evident in his eyes. Colleen reassured him by saying, Bill, you know you're the only man I've ever been interested in. I just needed to make sure that you wanted to be with me. Bill supported her, admitting, My wife is responsible for the three most joyful moments in my life. The day she agreed to become my wife. The day she became my wife, and later when she gave birth to our daughter, Caitlin. I couldn't help but notice the absence of any signs of my daughter. Sensing my curiosity, Colleen responded to my puzzled expression. Our daughter is currently away from home, receiving her doctorate in veterinary sciences from South Dakota State University. Unfortunately, she will only be able to return for the holidays, and we are looking forward to her return with a well-deserved diploma. She should be back home in a couple of months. Having a veterinarian in the family would be great. It would definitely help cut some costs. After we finished dinner, I tried to help clear the dishes, but Colleen insisted that it was her responsibility and kindly asked me to step aside. Bill informed us that breakfast would be served at 5.30 a.m. and work would start at 6. As Sam and I were about to leave, I noticed a copy of today's New York Times on the counter, which Bill probably picked up during his trip to the city. I asked if I could take the first page, and he kindly agreed. After we went outside, I invited him to join me in the hunt for a while. When we entered, I took out my digital camera and started showing him how to use it. Then I handed him the camera and asked him to take a close-up of me proudly showing off the front page of the newspaper. Although his curiosity was obvious, he refrained from asking questions. However, he expressed interest in purchasing an alarm clock, to which I assured him that I had one. Promising to meet in the morning, he said goodbye and left. Back at my hut, I transferred the resulting image to a computer and included it in a draft email. Along with the letter, I sent a message to the police of my former hometown to inform them that I was alive and well. I made it clear that I had voluntarily left the city. In order to remain anonymous, I decided to send a message not through a local, but through a national newspaper. After instructing my friend Jake, I asked him to use a local coffee shop with free internet access to send the letter. I shared my password with him, believing that my work mailbox would still work. To preserve my anonymity, I wanted to send the original letter and photo to the police without leaving any trace. It was his strategy to avoid being on the FBI or national missing persons lists, assuming that the police would not spend significant resources searching for the runaway husband. Having calmed down, I fell asleep peacefully. I woke up at five the next morning, showered and dressed quickly to go to the main house with Sam. After breakfast, Bill instructed Sam to give me some tasks. 
As we walked to the barn, Sam drew my attention to the horse and saddle that I would need. Watching how deftly I saddled the magnificent brown mare, he was pleased, knowing that I had gained previous experience on my uncle's ranch. The next task was to prepare two mules, attach saddlebags to carry fence posts, and a pit digger. In rare cases, we found ourselves in a situation where we had to euthanize a sick cow. After getting the horses ready and taking a mule in tow, Sam and I set off on a journey that took us along the creek and up the hills. As we rode side by side and talked, a bond began to form between us. I felt comfortable enough to confide in Sam, to tell him about the intricacies of my trip to Montana, believing that he would respect my trust. In turn, he reciprocated by talking about his own experiences. After catching his ex-wife in bed with another man, he was overcome with anger and eventually brutally attacked him. This deplorable act led to a lengthy prison sentence of five years. After his release, Bill turned out to be the only person who showed him kindness and offered him a second chance. That's why he spent the last three decades here, grateful for Bill's continued support. Sam admired Bill and Colleen, considering them to be truly kind-hearted people. In the end, half an hour later we drove up to the fence, which served as a clear demarcation of the boundaries of the site. Sam clarified that only rotten or near-rotting poles need to be replaced, that is, about one in three. He kindly stayed by my side while I replaced the first two pillars and made sure that I completed the task accurately. In order to manage my schedule effectively, he suggested that I continue working until about 4 o'clock, so that I would have enough time to take care of the horse and mules, and so that I could have dinner by 6. Before saying goodbye, he advised me to follow the path back along the stream, ensuring that I would not lose my way. Left alone with my tasks, I diligently continued to work, step by step replacing outdated posts with fresh ones. Around noon, I decided to take a well-deserved break and get the mouth-watering pork chop sandwiches that Colleen had kindly packed for me earlier. After devouring the sandwiches with satisfaction, I returned to my duties. Suddenly, the alarm clock on my watch signaled that it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon. As I watched my progress, I realized that I had successfully installed several poles that the mules had carried up the slope. When I went down, the descent was interrupted by an amazing find, a natural pool located among the trees, into which a stream smoothly flowed and flowed. Captivated by its beauty and tranquility, I stopped to admire the breathtaking view and realized that this is the most serene place on the entire ranch. Back in the barn, I deftly removed the saddles from the animals and made sure that they were fed on time. While I was tending the horses, Sam joined me leading his horse to find a comfortable place to rest. In a hurry, we quickly washed and changed our clothes before getting ready for dinner. In the evening, we enjoyed the juicy steaks, enjoying the flavors that danced to our tastes. I hardly participated in the conversation, and after dinner I quickly left for the night. Drowsiness came quickly, and I fell into a deep sleep. When I woke up I felt pain all over my body. My arms ached from working with the digger, and my arms, shoulders, and legs were constantly throbbing. Despite the routine workouts, there was a noticeable contrast between a two-hour session at the gym and a whole day spent installing fence posts. I hobbled into the kitchen and, sinking into a chair, grimaced. Bill and Sam managed to get a couple of laughs out of me, and even Colleen couldn't quite hide her smile. Although I felt a little sick, Hunger got the better of me and I enthusiastically devoured my breakfast. When we all got up from the table, Bill asked if I was ready for another day of fencing. Releasing a groan, I reluctantly, with forced optimism, replied, Yes, sir. Bill grinned and offered, I think you can take a break today. I'd like you to accompany Sam on his rounds instead. I nodded gratefully. Our first duty was to clean up the stalls and replenish the hay. After we safely moved the horses and mules to the pasture and made sure they had enough food, we got into the pickup truck and went to inspect the ranch. Our main task was to make sure that no cow was lying down or isolated from her calves. 
Sam's familiarity with the ranch turned out to be almost innate, and he easily located the cattle and gave a rough estimate of their number. He had a natural talent for it. When we arrived at the edge of the ranch, Sam stopped the truck and began to look at the landscape. His gaze stopped at one place on the top of the hill, which made him hand me the binoculars and point at it with a gesture. After a moment, I noticed two cows that seemed to be isolated from each other. Curiosity was aroused in me, and I asked a question about the absence of their mothers, to which he nodded towards two cows located at the edge of the trees. Here they are, he confirmed. It looks like their mothers wandered behind the trees, turned around and walked on. I suggested, shall we go down to get to them? No way, it's pretty far away. Let's go back and get a couple of horses. Our pickups were equipped with two-way radios, so Sam contacted Bill to inform him of our findings and the plan to return the horses. When we arrived at the barn, we found that Bill had already saddled two horses and secured them in the trailer. All that remained was to gather supplies and hit the road. Following Sam's instructions, we came to the edge of the tree line where the calves lived. After unloading the horses, we set off across the hills. It was obvious that Sam's three decades of experience on the ranch was truly invaluable, as he easily maneuvered through familiar terrain. After about 30 minutes, we carefully approached the calves from behind, starting to gently push them down. I couldn't help but laugh when we came out from behind the trees and the naughty kids saw their mothers. In complete delight, they quickly rushed to their mothers, uttering joyful cries and then eagerly clung to the nipple to feed. Watching the majestic towering cows, I couldn't help but notice their serene demeanor as they graciously allowed their offspring to feed on their own. This stark contrast to my own childhood experience struck me to the core. Later in the evening, our dinner consisted of delicious fried chicken, juicy corn on the cob and velvety mashed potatoes. Filled with a newfound sense of cheerfulness, I joined in a lively conversation, eager to learn more about Colleen's intriguing life story. During our dialogue, I learned that her parents left their native Ireland and immigrated to the United States when she was only five years old. It was her father's constant fascination with stories about the Old West that led their family to settle in the picturesque landscapes of Montana. The imprint of the Irish brogue became noticeable in her speech, despite the fact that she grew up in America and was influenced by her parents. After a good night, I felt much better, and after breakfast I returned to work on replacing the fence posts. Sam helped me prepare the food, but this time I set off alone. Following the stream, I easily reached my intended destination. Surprisingly, this day turned out to be less difficult than the previous one, as I mastered several techniques that facilitate physical activity. I finished the last task and returned to the barn. I had some free time and decided to work in a few stalls before getting ready for dinner. The next day I joined Sam in repairing some of the buildings, and the next day I focused on installing new fence posts. Time seemed to fly by imperceptibly, and before I knew it, two months had passed. Now it was my turn to drive around the ranch and keep an eye on the welfare of the cattle. I felt amazing being in the best physical shape of my entire life. On my days off, which usually fell on Mondays, I did the laundry and sometimes went to the city if necessary. Over time, I developed a liking for the people living on the ranch. Sam, in particular, had a good-natured and calm personality and often engaged in pleasant conversations with me after dinner. Bill, on the other hand, commanded my deepest respect because of his honesty and hard work. Our compatibility was obvious, and we got along great. Meanwhile, Colleen showed amazing comeliness towards both Sam and me, although there was a hidden spark in her. As a whole, she and Bill made a wonderful couple. Colleen and Bill's anticipation grew. During Friday morning breakfast, Colleen shared the exciting news that her daughter would be returning home in just seven days. By a lucky chance, that day I had to go on horseback and explore the forest area to make sure that no cattle had wandered into the hills. At about four o'clock, I headed for the stream, 
tracing its course down until I reached a serene pool under a cascading waterfall. Stopping, I took off my shirt and gracefully knelt at the water's edge. After immersing the bandana in refreshing water, I began the process of cleansing my face and neck from sweat and dirt. Suddenly, my attention was attracted by a melodious sound coming from below, which made me shift my gaze to the right. To my amazement, a horseman on a horse was walking towards me. At first I mistook this figure for Colleen, but I quickly realized that this was her younger incarnation. This charming lady could only be Caitlin, the owner of the same mesmerizing crystal blue eyes and fiery red hair as her mother. Coming closer, she gracefully stopped her horse a few steps away from me, forcing me to stand up and meet her gaze. In a cold voice, she asked, Who are you? And why did you invade this territory? I answered confidently, I'm Carson, and I work here. There was doubt in her eyes, and she replied, I find it hard to believe. My father said he couldn't afford to hire extra help. Although she was charmed by her beauty, her unfriendly behavior began to annoy me, and I couldn't help but reply, Yes, I heard that too. She stared at me, intrigued. I slapped him sharply on the sides and playfully pushed the horse forward. Amused, I chuckled to myself and quickly put on my shirt. Mounting my horse, I continued on my way to the barn. I didn't know that there was a misunderstanding between Caitlin and her parents. They didn't know that she arrived just a few hours after I set off. After spending the morning and early afternoon with her parents, Caitlin eventually discovered that she really wanted to go for a ride. Finally, she had the chance to do something she passionately loved to do, but did not have the opportunity to do it at university. Saddling her horse, she headed to her favorite place, a serene waterfall and a refreshing pool of water. But it seemed that in two months they had forgotten about me, since Bill and Colleen had never mentioned my presence. It was only when I drove up to the barn that I caught a glimpse of a red head coming in ahead of me. I jumped off my horse and headed inside. I could clearly hear her voice when she asked loudly, Who is the man who was at the waterfall? Bill thought for a moment before replying, It must have been Carson. She interjected, He mentioned that he works here, but the last time I was here you said you couldn't afford to hire another employee. Bill replied, Well, he's telling the truth. He works here. But I don't think you care about his salary. I'm still in charge of this ranch, young lady. But he mentioned that you are paying him such a significant amount that it gives him great joy. When I entered the barn, I noticed that she had turned her back on me, unaware of my presence. But Bill noticed me and, flashing a smile, asked, Is that true, Carson? If you think that you are receiving excessive compensation, of course I can deal with it. In response, she quickly turned around, luring me into her domain. I took off my hat with one hand, and with the other I nervously scratched the back of my head and said, How much are you seriously going to cut my salary? Hearing this, Bill and I burst out laughing. But she looked at us stubbornly, not finding anything funny in the situation. Honey, relax a little, Bill interjected, trying to soften her disappointment. Carson has the privilege of staying in the cabin adjacent to Sam's cabin. Her reaction was immediate. Is that all? Bill replied. Well, not only that, but also that he will be able to enjoy your mother's exquisite culinary creations. Why would he work without a salary? The girl asked. He has his own motives, and it's not for me to reveal them to you. Perhaps he is motivated by a desire to enjoy your mother's culinary creations, which is very valuable and I doubt that she would appreciate your belittling of her merits as insignificant. In response, she gave me a disapproving look and stormed out of the barn. Shaking his head, Bill remarked, She reminds me so much of her mother when she was young. I never thought that I would end up with someone like Colleen. Later that evening, Caitlin joined us for dinner. She took a seat across the table from me and sat next to Sam. As soon as I crossed the threshold of the kitchen, she looked at me intently. I waited patiently for everyone to have a treat before breaking the silence. Adopting a pleasant tone, I addressed her. Your mother mentioned that you have received a doctorate in veterinary medicine. Without looking up, she answered abruptly with one word. Yes. 
Taking advantage of the opportunity, I continued. According to Sam, there is only one other veterinarian in the vicinity, and he is more than 30 miles away. I have no doubt that you will become an invaluable addition to the society here, I commented, drawing her attention. She looked up, and for a moment it seemed to me that her gaze softened. This must be Dr. Harrison, I thought to myself. He is always overwhelmed with work, and is often needed in several places at the same time. Colin joined the conversation, confirming my words. Carson is right, Caitlin. You will be able to offer exceptional service. The conversation continued until the end of the meal, while Caitlin talked with her parents and Sam. She lived on the ranch before she was born. She didn't address me directly, and I was mostly silent. It was her return to her roots, and I knew that her parents and Sam couldn't wait to hear about her adventures during her absence. After finishing my meal, I politely took my leave and went to sleep. Back at the cabin, I logged into my email and noticed a message from Jake. He informed me that he had been in contact with a friend from the police. I casually asked if they thought I was missing. His friend reported that all fears were dispelled after receiving an email with a photo that I sent. As for Janice, it seems that Brandon quickly broke off relations with her after discovering my sudden disappearance with all the money, leaving Janice with little hope of getting it in the near future. Naturally, she couldn't pay the rent of the house we used to live in, and currently occupied a city apartment, working as a waitress. It seemed ironic to me that she couldn't afford to hire a lawyer to pursue me, given that she married me solely because of my wealth. Similarly, her boyfriend was interested in her for the same reason, because of my money. Meanwhile, I continued to work hard on replacing the fence posts, albeit in slow motion. Instead of doing this every day, I now devoted myself to this activity only every third or fourth day. I moved down the hill and settled in a more accessible location, which allowed me to conveniently get to work in my pickup truck. Loading the poles onto a truck turned out to be much easier than using mules to transport them. The day after Caitlin arrived, I packed my things in a pickup truck and went to the place where I stopped working. When the usual lunch break came, I went to the pickup truck and suddenly realized that I had forgotten to take lunch with me. Usually, Colin made sure that everyone who worked away from the main house had lunch, but I apparently completely forgot to take mine. Although I could easily return to the house by car, I decided that skipping one meal would not harm my well-being. As I was fixing the wire to a newly installed pole, the sound of an approaching car caught my attention. Looking over my shoulder, I noticed that it was one of the familiar trucks from the ranch. The truck stopped just as I finished my work. Turning around, I was surprised to see Caitlin getting out of the car. She was holding a small bag in her hand similar to the ones Colleen used for my dinners. With a gentle gesture, she handed it to me and said, Mom mentioned that you forgot your lunch. Gratefully, I reached out and accepted the package from her, expressing my appreciation. Thank you, Caitlin. I appreciate your kindness, I replied gratefully. Looking into the bag, I found two ordinary sandwiches there. Taking one of them for myself, I handed the other to her but was gently refused. Puzzled, I shrugged and settled into the back seat of the truck to enjoy the meal. Without stopping, she came and stood five feet away from me, staring at me. Ignoring her gaze, I continued to devour my food, focusing on the landscape ahead. I looked in her direction, considering the idea of making fun of her. Grinning mischievously, I said, Remember, this is just between us. You see, I could have committed a daring bank robbery and cunningly hidden the money. For now, I'm lying at the bottom until the situation cools down, and then I'll get my precious loot back. At first, her eyes widened in surprise, but soon they narrowed to a piercing stare. You're such a joker, she grumbled, clearly not amused at all. Annoyed, she turned on her heel to leave. I waited patiently until she reached her truck, and then called her name. When the sound of her name rang out in the air, she froze in place. I stopped abruptly, turning to face her. Sighing heavily, I confessed, I got married to a woman who never really loved me. 
She only wanted the material benefits that I could offer her. In search of solace, I found myself in this place, wanting to escape from the familiar past. Her gaze settled on me again, and I felt that this time she believed my words. A slight nod of her head signified understanding and she left, preferring silence to further conversation. As she drove, I reflected on her father's words that she looked like her mother at the same stage of her life. He claimed to have tamed her, but deep down, I believed it was all about their deep love for each other. Less than a day had passed since my first meeting with Caitlin, and I could hardly imagine that any of the men would be able to tame the ardent nature of this red-haired girl. Our evening meal was a repeat of the previous one. Caitlin was talking to her parents and Sam. I couldn't help but feel a little invisible as she still didn't notice my presence and the lack of a common language between us. When we finished dinner, the feeling of disconnection did not leave me. When there was a knock in the house, Bill rushed to the door. He was followed by a gentleman about my age. Women would easily describe him as tall, dark-haired, and handsome. Caitlin couldn't contain her delight as she shouted his name and immediately jumped up from her seat to hug him. It was obvious that they knew each other, talking animatedly about the length of their separation. Moments later, another knock interrupted the scene, forcing Bill to open the door again, this time with another man. The blonde man stood out among the crowd with his striking appearance. Caitlin, equally stunning, greeted him warmly, reminding him of the attention her mother received. Bill's words about having to fight off countless suitors to get a wife echoed in my head. In terms of appearance, Caitlin was as much a prey as her mother. Feeling a pang of jealousy, I politely left the table and retired to my hut. Deep down, I sincerely wished these two men luck. If Caitlin inherited her mother's exceptional qualities, it would be difficult for them to achieve her. Any man who managed to capture her heart would consider himself incredibly lucky. The next day, I got into a pickup truck and started a detour around the ranch. But while completing the tasks, I couldn't get rid of the feeling that something was wrong. It was still early, so I went back to get Sam, and together we went on a whirlwind tour of the entire ranch. Despite the huge number of scattered cattle that we encountered, there was an undeniable feeling that something was wrong. It seemed that we had missed several herds, Having decided to get to the truth, we decided to get in the saddle the next day and explore the hilly areas of the ranch. Bill and I discussed our plan over dinner that evening. To my relief, he gave his consent. Unfortunately, the night was accompanied by rain, which made it difficult to find traces. When the sun rose the next day, we wasted no time loading the horses into the trailer. Bill kindly offered to take us to one of the ends of the lot. I set off driving a third of the way to the forest line, and Sam went even higher. Together we crossed the ranch, climbing hills and making our way through clusters of trees. It took a significant part of the day before we finally reached the opposite side. To our delight, during the expedition we managed to count a total of five stray herds. When we left the hills, Bill was waiting for our arrival ready to help us load the horses into the trailer before we set off on our way back. While talking, we discussed the current situation and came to the general conclusion that the most appropriate course of action would be to increase vigilance. Later that evening, during dinner, Caitlin received another phone call, but in a more affectionate tone. When she heard her mother's whispered comment that this was the third call of the day, she realized that the news of her return had spread causing a surge of interested people claiming her attention. Therefore, the next four days were devoted to careful monitoring of the herd, ensuring its safety and well-being. Despite the fact that everything was outwardly in order, one worry remained, the suspicion of an initial loss. Caitlin's Quakers still visited me, but since the day she delivered my lunch, she hasn't said a word for a whole week. On the fifth day after the cattle went missing, I told Bill about my plan to drive along the property line through the hills. We have already carefully examined all the fence lines surrounding the pastures, but we have not found a single sign indicating that the disappeared cattle passed through this area. 
Sam drove me to the west side of the ranch, just where Bill's property intersected with Wilson's ranch. Heading towards the southwest corner, I came across three groups of newly made horse tracks. These footprints came from the fence on Wilson's side and crossed over to Bill's side. I was puzzled by the fact that the fence wire remained intact despite such activity. Deciding to investigate further, I got off my horse and carefully examined the fence posts. To my surprise, I noticed that the staples on the five posts were intentionally loosened and barely held the wire in place. Having lowered the wire, it was easy to get over it, returning it to its original position with the help of staples. I mounted my horse and continued along the trail. As I approached the stream, I noticed three horses tied to a tree right above the waterfall. Stopping about 30 yards away from them, I quickly dismounted from my horse, secured it to a nearby tree and took my rifle from its scabbard. Cautiously approaching the horses, I noticed boot prints leading downstream. Cautiously I approached the edge of the waterfall. When I looked back, my eyes widened in surprise. Caitlin was standing there in the pool, completely naked. It seemed like she had just been born. I was fascinated by this sight as she gracefully swam through the crystal clear water. Her naked body was on display which made me tremble. I couldn't help but admire her amazing figure, especially her attractive backside. But a sudden movement among the trees to her right brought me back to reality. After quickly scanning the surroundings, I noticed a lone figure on her right and two more people approaching the pond on her left. A single shot rang out, narrowly missing the legs of the man standing to the right. Another sharp pull on the trigger caused the ground to scatter in a cloud of mud, ending up dangerously close to the two people on the left. The piercing scream that escaped from Caitlin's mouth echoed through the surrounding trees. Deciding to take the situation into my own hands, I got to my feet so that everyone could see me, and urgently shouted, Get down on the ground immediately! I won't miss my next shot!" Firmly ordering Caitlin to stay where she was, ignoring the three menacing figures lurking nearby. All she could feel was my presence looming over her, rifle in hand. She was trying to cover her body, and her efforts were obvious. The man on the left started, as if about to run, but when I pulled the trigger again, the bark of the tree next to him burst, causing him to become convinced of the danger and fall flat to the ground. Caitlin turned her gaze to the place where I was shooting from and noticed two men, which caused another scream to escape her lips. I started counting down, but before I reached the number one, the remaining two people quickly sank to the ground. Without hesitation, I ordered them to put their hands behind their heads, and they obediently obeyed. In a hurry, I insisted that Caitlin leave and get dressed. Despite her attempts to object, I sternly demanded that she follow my instructions without delay. She was overcome with fear, as evidenced by the trembling, but she obeyed my order and left the pool. It was a mesmerizing sight when she emerged from the water, looking like Venus emerging from the sea. Although she kept her back turned to me, I couldn't help but be charmed by her presence. The image of the most perfectly shaped figure I have ever seen is forever etched in my memory. She easily put on jeans and a shirt and easily mounted a horse. With one light push, she disappeared into the dense foliage. As soon as she disappeared, I ordered each of the men to get up from the ground and quickly take a lying position. It was only when all three of them were lying in front of me that I finally breathed a sigh of relief. Thinking about my next move, I chose a deception tactic. So, what should I do with you three? I suppose I could just hurt your legs by bleeding until it's fatal, I mused. Instantly, despair gripped the three men, and they begged for mercy. I replied calmly, Even if I spare your lives, Caitlin's father will seek justice as soon as I reveal your disgusting plans for his daughter. Unless, of course, you have a more convincing confession for the sheriff, possibly related to the cattle theft. It may lead to imprisonment, but it will give you at least a small hope of survival. In the group, the youngest couldn't stand the pressure and finally gave up. We did it! Wilson exclaimed, confident that by defeating Buckman, 
he would protect his property. Despite the team's attempts to silence him, he defiantly declared that he would not risk his life for the sake of a simple herd of cows. Knowing that Caitlin would be back soon and her father would start investigating, I decided to take my time. As expected, Bill and Sam appeared 45 minutes later on horseback. I motioned for them to come over, and together we quickly climbed the hill to join me. Bill sounded disappointed. What the hell is going on here? He demanded. Obviously one of Wilson's lackeys thought it best to pay us an uninvited visit. I was able to trace their footsteps from the fence line all the way to this place. While Caitlin was enjoying her swim, these three sneaky intruders tried to get to her unnoticed. Having taken measures, I went up to them and firmly pressed the barrel of the rifle against the neck of the smaller man. It was clear that he needed to confess something. In response, the man whined softly. It was Wilson who made us act. Adjusting his hat and smiling mischievously at Sam, Bill nostalgically talked about how his ancestors administered justice on the ranch. In those days, horse thieves and rustlers met their fate at the end of a rope. The simplicity of that era was in stark contrast to the complexities of modern civilization. While Sam dutifully stood guard, Bill and I made a unanimous decision to lead the rustlers back, and our rifles served as a stern reminder of the consequences they would face. Sam secured their horses so that they could not escape, and he moved at the tail of our determined procession. Upon arrival, we sent the rustlers to the barn, carefully distributing them into separate stalls with open doors. This strategic placement allowed us to conduct surveillance without suspecting each other's presence. At that time, Bill went to the house to notify the sheriff, while Sam and I remained on guard. Remarkably, just half an hour later, the sheriff arrived quickly, racing down an extensive mile-long driveway. Bill quickly informed him of the situation. I suggested that the lesser criminal be brought out first so that the sheriff could conduct an interrogation, to which he readily agreed. Without hesitation, I quickly took my prisoner outside. At first, the young troublemaker looked reluctant, but then he seemed to change his mind and spoke. The sheriff looked at Bill and remarked, it looks like this is a simple case of illegal entry. To be honest, it's not worth my precious time, but I suppose I can entrust them to you. Pretend I didn't see them, and you take care of it. The eyes of the alarmed rustler widened, and he immediately began to spread the information. I urgently requested help, and soon a string of sheriff's cars quickly pulled up to Wilson's sprawling ranch. Despite the huge size of the ranch, the sheriff pinpointed the location indicated by the thief and led them to almost a hundred stolen cattle marked with the brand Rocking Bee. By the end of the day, Wilson and his accomplices were arrested and taken into custody. In the midst of this chaos, it was well past nine o'clock in the evening when we finally gathered for a meal. Bill asked her about what she had been doing lately without taking his eyes off his plate. It was obvious that he didn't have many opportunities to strike up a conversation with her. What exactly were you doing there? What is it? He asked, his tone full of curiosity. Trying to defend herself, she shot me a piercing look, accusing me of inappropriate behavior. To clarify the situation, I intervened. Caitlin, let me assure you that I was not spying on you. I was just following the tracks of their horses and came across a stream, Moreover, it's worth thinking about the possible consequences if I hadn't been there. Colleen expressed doubt that these three people were going to have a picnic after seeing her bathing naked. She commented, Carson, we are grateful that you showed up at that moment. It's disturbing for us to think about what might have happened. When the conversation turned to another topic, we hurriedly finished our meal, remembering that it was early morning ahead. As I headed for my cabin, Caitlin called out to me. I stopped and waited for her to ask rudely, Did you appreciate the scenery today? To be honest, I can't deny that it was really awe-inspiring, I muttered. Disappointed, she walked quickly away towards the house. I remained standing, shaking my head, realizing that there was some undeniable aspect to my presence that had always fascinated her. The next day, 
Bill had to go to town to formally charge Wilson. It will take several days to return the stolen cattle to its rightful place, since the prosecutor had to carefully document the case beforehand. I spent the whole day applying a fresh coat of paint to the outbuildings. We had lunch in the kitchen, although Caitlin chose not to join us, which pleased me. Bill returned after lunch, but decided to wait until dinner to let us know about the latest updates. He clarified that since the case is not considered a major one, Wilson and his partners will be released on bail. Although he did not foresee any new problems, he advised us to be vigilant and careful. Bill grinned playfully and suggested, Hey, if you want to take another dip, maybe Carson should work as your bodyguard. Just for extra protection, of course. Embarrassment washed over her again, causing her face to turn red, and she hurriedly got up and hurriedly left the room. Bill and Sam burst out laughing, and even Colleen couldn't suppress a giggle. I joined them too, chuckling. When the laughter subsided, we returned to the meal, and Bill continued his light-hearted banter. Carson, I can't express my gratitude. Wilson's actions could have put our ranch in a difficult financial situation. You really deserve every penny for your exceptional work. Laughter filled the air again as we all shared this moment. Soon after, Bill received the long-awaited news that his cattle could be taken away. After loading three horses into the trailer, we went to Wilson's Flying Doll Ranch, accompanied by the sheriff's escort. Colleen joined us to take the truck and trailer back when the horses were safely unloaded. I took the initiative and led the cows back to his ranch. When we got to the Swinging Bee Ranch, I took the initiative and untied part of the fence, allowing Scott to walk through it. After making sure that all the cows were safe, we secured the fence and drove back to the main house, feeling that we had finished our work for the day. Meanwhile, Caitlin has taken steps to obtain a veterinarian's license. The process of obtaining a license usually takes about 45 days. At the moment, her main focus was solely on caring for the animals at her father's ranch. I often caught a glimpse of her at the site and, of course, during meals. Despite her stubborn silence towards me, whenever our eyes met, I smiled warmly and playfully raised my eyebrows, which made her cheeks turn rosy. Two weeks after the incident at the waterfall, we happened to be together in the barn, and I couldn't resist asking, Have you been swimming lately? In response, she came up to me a few centimeters away and looked at me intently. Why do you persist in causing trouble? I shrugged, a mischievous grin spread across my face and replied, Why do you embody a buzzing bee? With disappointment in her eyes, she waved her right hand towards my face, but I quickly intercepted her movement, gripping her wrist tightly before she could connect. Not calming down, she tried to strike with her left hand, but I managed to intercept her as well. Taking control of the situation, I put both her hands behind her back, effectively immobilizing them, and brought her body closer to mine. Gradually, I bent down to her face, leaving her bewildered and captivated by my actions. It was she who ended up on Earth. I held her back, making no attempt to free myself. In response to her defiant remark, I couldn't resist answering, If you were at my disposal, I would take the liberty of punishing you by spanking you severely. Her attempt to confront me was weak as she responded with an audacious statement, You don't have the guts. Out of surprise, I decided to loosen my grip, as a result of which she staggered back and landed awkwardly on the back of her body. It's not that I didn't have the courage to follow through with my words. I just didn't want to waste time with another woman who wasn't paying attention to my feelings. She was usually the one who left in a fit of anger, but this time it was the other way around. I walked out of the barn, leaving her behind, knowing that it was finally my turn. I didn't realize that our paths wouldn't cross again before dinner. As expected, she didn't say a word, but her expression was a mystery that I couldn't solve. Women have always been a mystery to me, as has my failed marriage to Janice. The next day, while I was tidying up the stalls in the barn, Bill came in to me. Since he had a day off on Sunday, I figured he wanted to talk. I wondered if Caitlin had shared the details of yesterday's incident with him, and if his visit meant that he wanted me to leave. When he came towards me, I stopped working. Then he spoke. 
I heard you and Caitlin had a bit of a fight yesterday. This answered my question about Caitlin's trust in her father, but I couldn't help but notice the mischievous gleam in his eyes. In response, I admitted, Yes, you can probably say that. It was probably my fault. He replied, Maybe, maybe not. From my point of view, her predicament is related to the uncertainty of your intentions. At first, she thought you had a purpose to be here, but soon you turned into a heroic figure who saved both her and the ranch. Still, it puzzles her that you're not stalking her, unlike the other young men nearby who seemed desperate to get her attention. Like her mother at her age, Caitlin used to easily arouse the interest of guys. Although she had a few boyfriends, none of them lasted long, which makes me think she never really respected them. Therefore, my only wish is not to let her bully you into leaving. That's my point of view. I've decided to put an end to this. Bill's words made me realize how important it is to treat Caitlin with respect and give her freedom. So I promised myself to stop teasing her and instead establish a more peaceful coexistence. With these thoughts in mind, I continued to work in the barn, grateful for the opportunity to reflect on Bill's advice. It dawned on me that if I really want Caitlin to understand me, then I need to engage in meaningful conversations with her and behave politely and not harass her, as I have done with others in the past. It just shouldn't have happened. She didn't join us for dinner that night. The subject remained unspoken, and I decided not to ask myself that question. The next day, I stuck to my usual routine, getting up at 5 o'clock even on my day off. Breakfast was quickly eaten. As soon as Sam and Bill left for work, I packed up my laundry. Thanks to Bill's investment in a spacious commercial washer dryer, I could conveniently wash all my clothes in one cycle. While my clothes were being washed in the laundry room conveniently located next to the kitchen, I found myself sitting at the kitchen table, enjoying a meal and having a pleasant conversation with my friend Colleen. It was quite unusual to see Caitlin joining us for breakfast, as she usually preferred to eat at a later time. Colleen asked about my plans for the day, and I mentioned my intention to go to the city. In response, I asked if she needed to bring anything. Without hesitation, she kindly asked for a few things, to which I was happy to assure her that I would be happy to help. At that moment, Caitlin suddenly broke off and asked, Can I go to the city with you? I need to stop by the store to pick up some things, and it's not advisable for both of us to go separately. I looked up, startled by her request, and answered, Of course I'll be happy to give you a ride. After yesterday's events, I did not expect that she would talk to me, much less suggest that we go together. I informed her that I would leave in about an hour and a half, as soon as I had finished and put away the laundry. She was silent, looking out the window with a contemplative expression on her face. Meanwhile, Colleen and I were having a lively conversation, unaware of what thoughts were occupying her mind. After a while, I decided to leave the hut and found her gracefully coming out of the back door. She was wearing a mesmerizing turquoise sundress that perfectly complemented her fiery red curls. It was clear that she craved my attention. Like a gentleman, I readily opened the door for her, admiring her as she easily settled into the passenger seat of the car. She sat in silence, admiring the serene countryside. Suddenly she broke the silence by saying, I thought you were going to kiss me yesterday. Looking in her direction, I noticed that her gaze was fixed on the side window, hiding her expression. Unable to read her face, I replied, Although this meeting may not have been unpleasant, I adhere to a personal rule not to impose unwanted feelings on those who are not receptive. When I felt her quickly turn her head in my direction, I felt her intense gaze fixed on me. She became calm again. I couldn't help but notice how she occasionally glanced in my direction. When we reached the store, we went inside. I was going to buy some new pairs of jeans and shirts, and she had a list of things her mother needed. An hour later, we successfully collected all the necessary things and loaded them into the car. But before I went to the hardware store to get a few things for Bill, I realized that it was already lunchtime and I was hungry. Having suggested the idea of a snack, she readily agreed. So we parked at a familiar diner. 
It was at this moment that I first encountered Bill and Colleen. We sat down at the table facing each other and quickly placed an order for food. As we sat in silence, it occurred to me that maybe I should skip this gathering and head straight to the hardware store before returning to the ranch. Suddenly the door burst open and a group of three men burst into the room. I immediately recognized two of them as those who had previously visited Caitlin. With unwavering determination, they walked to our table, sitting on either side, and the third one sat behind me. I was completely ignored until they started talking to her. In response, I got up from my seat and motioned for a third person to take my place, and I moved to another table. When the food arrived, I motioned to the waitress and asked her to put my dish right in front of me. Ignoring the discussion going on at Caitlin's table, I hurriedly started eating. To pay the bill, I casually threw some money on the table and stood up. Caitlin, meanwhile, barely touched her food, leaving her plate untouched. I need to go to the hardware store right away, I said before I left. I can look in here later to check if you're ready to leave, I interjected, interrupting their conversation. She pushed her plate away and rose from her seat, announcing, It was nice talking to all of you, but it's time for us to leave. Those sitting at the table tried to object, and one even offered to give her a ride home. Politely refusing, she came out to me on the street and got into my SUV. Throughout the trip to the hardware store, she stayed in the car, seemingly fuming. There was an uneasy silence in the air as we walked back to the ranch. We turned off the highway and drove down a mile-long driveway. Breaking the silence, she asked, Why did you do that? Confused, I replied, What do you mean? Not understanding what she was getting at. That's it. I hesitated before explaining, Well, I thought you'd like to spend time with your friends. Besides, I didn't want to be in the middle of their fight for your attention. Suddenly disappointment boiled up in her and she replied, You really are such a jerk. I made the wise decision to keep quiet because I wasn't going to tolerate her slapping me at the wheel. Arriving at the main house, she quickly grabbed everything she could carry as soon as I opened the back door of the SUV. I packed up the extra bags and followed her as we entered the house. When I entered the back door, she unceremoniously dumped all the things on the kitchen table without saying a word to her mother, and then cheerfully headed into another room. Colleen gave me a questioning look, to which I responded with an impassive shrug. Colleen let out a playful laugh and walked towards me, carefully placing her hand on my arm. I've never seen anyone have the same influence on Caitlin as you have, she remarked. I shrugged back feeling a mixture of amusement and disappointment. I guess I was destined to be just a source of irritation for her, I admitted. Colleen's next words made me think, not understanding what she meant. Shaking off my embarrassment, I headed back to the hut, carefully folding the clothes I had just purchased. But the thought of staying in the house bothered me, and I decided to go to the barn and prepare the horse for a walk. When I set off, my road took me to the top of the waterfall. One pleasant day, I tied my horse to a sturdy tree and sat on the cliff of a cascading waterfall, gazing intently at the mesmerizing pool below. Fascinated by the serene scene, I stood there for what seemed like an eternity. Caitlin suddenly appeared on horseback and gracefully dismounted from her horse right under my vantage point. Not wanting to appear to be spying on her if she suddenly decided to plunge into the water naked again, I took out a stone and carelessly threw it into the water, causing a resounding splash. Startled by the unexpected sound, Caitlin turned her head in search of its source and eventually discovered my presence. Instead, she got on a horse and rode up to where I was sitting. Tying her horse next to mine, she headed towards me. Sensing a possible threat, I cautiously took a few steps away from the edge, ready for any hostile intentions. You're in the hayloft, she said, standing a few inches away from me. I replied with a touch of disdain. And you're still a bee. Without waiting for the expected slap in the face, I took the initiative and hugged her tightly around the waist, biting into her lips with a passionate kiss. 
She grabbed my arm tightly, forcing me to turn back to face her. I was completely stunned when her hand reached for my neck and pulled me into another deep, unexpected kiss. Tension flared up between us again, causing the space around us to fade. Our clothes were slowly disappearing. We were lost in the heat of the moment, sharing an unforgettable experience. When the fervor subsided, we gradually regained control of our breathing, savoring the lingering bond we shared. In quiet serenity, we dressed, mounted our horses, and set off on our way back. Without exchanging a single word, we tended to our horses, silently acknowledging the profound encounter we had just experienced. As she headed towards the main house, I couldn't help but stare after her. This encounter left me perplexed and forced me to return to the hut. In search of solace, I took refuge under the soothing jets of the shower. It was at this moment of reflection that I finally admitted to myself the intensity of my feelings for her. They turned out to be much deeper than I had initially assumed. Wasting no time, I hurried to get dressed for dinner. When I entered the kitchen, I found that Bill, Colleen, and Sam were already sitting at the table, and Caitlin, oddly enough, was missing. I had barely taken my place at the table when she appeared, gracefully entering the room. Instead of taking her usual seat next to Sam, Caitlin surprised everyone by choosing a chair next to mine. Bill and Colleen exchanged glances, trying to make sense of this unexpected change. But Caitlin didn't seem surprised at all and just smiled sweetly in response. Throughout the dinner, she was animated and engaged in conversation, which attracted the curiosity of her parents. Despite wanting to ask, they refrained from asking why their daughter was in such an upbeat mood. After the meal, Caitlin volunteered to help her mother clean the kitchen, and Sam and I went back to our huts. When I finally settled down between the sheets, ready to rest, Caitlin's actions and behavior did not leave my mind. There was a soft knock on the door. In my boxers, I carefully opened it, finding Caitlin standing there. Without hesitation, she slipped inside and found comfort in my arms. Our lips met in a gentle kiss as she led me back to the bed. After taking off her clothes, she joined me, and we confessed our love to each other again, after which we fell asleep peacefully, entangled in each other's arms. The sudden arrival of five in the morning roused me from my slumber, and I reached out to turn off the beeping alarm clock. I successfully freed myself from the clutches of the bed and began to clean up the bathroom. Hastily dressing, I kissed her gently on the forehead and then quietly left the hut. While having breakfast, I couldn't help but notice Bill and Colleen's suspicious looks. I wondered if they knew about their daughter's late-night adventures. After finishing my meal, I loaded up the pickup truck, preparing for another day of installing fence posts. Working on a ranch alone gave me many opportunities for deep reflection. When I let my thoughts wander, I found myself reflecting on my recent past, completely amazed that it had only been three months since I broke up with my wife. It seemed like an eternity had passed. So many things had changed. Thoughts of Bill, Colleen, and Sam flooded my mind and I reflected on their impact on my life. But soon my thoughts turned to the charming Caitlin and those delightful moments that we had shared just the day before. It made me wonder if I would ever be able to experience love that would reflect the amazing bond her parents had. When I was lost in thought, it was time for lunch, and I was again struck by the realization that I had again forgotten to take food with me. As soon as this thought occurred to me, I noticed a pickup truck rushing towards me. Caitlin jumped out of it and rushed to me with a bag in her hands. She eagerly rushed into my arms, kissed me fervently, and handed me the package. Ignoring the contents of the bag, I pulled her closer and kissed her hard again. That day, my attention shifted from installing fence posts to passionate moments with her. Recounting the intricate details of my past life, I vividly recalled the painful betrayal committed against me by my ex-wife. But I assured her that I would leave only if she gave me a clear instruction. It was with a sense of relief that she eventually returned home, allowing me to complete the chores that had filled my day. 
After taking a refreshing shower and changing my clothes, I found her in the kitchen when I entered and took my place next to mine again. When we sat down at the table to enjoy our meal, an unexpected knock interrupted our tranquility, coming from the other side of the front door. Caitlin's attention was immediately attracted by the man who began to communicate with her. As soon as he sat down, she turned her gaze to him, her emotions hidden behind an unfathomable expression. I was wondering if you'd like to take a ride with me, he offered. In this region, where there were few opportunities, a car trip meant, in fact, a romantic walk. I'm grateful for the invitation, but I don't think my boyfriend will approve, Caitlin replied, bending down to kiss me affectionately on the cheek. Blushing and stumbling in mid-sentence, Mr. Tull, dark-haired and handsome, hurriedly left, marking a turning point in our relationship. I glanced at Bill and Colleen who smiled approvingly, and even Sam couldn't help but grin broadly. It was official. Now we were a couple. In the days that followed, there were no more visits from local men seeking Caitlin's attention. She made it clear that they were not going to get anything else. I also found a way to support her in achieving her goals. In search of a loan for her veterinary business, she turned to the bank to get funds to purchase the necessary equipment. But the bank did not want to provide an unsecured loan, and she had no choice but to ask her father to provide the ranch as collateral. Not wanting to burden her father, I offered an alternative. I advised you to give me a short period of time because I thought I had a solution. After taking action, I contacted my offshore bank, opening an account under the guise of a fictitious credit company. After several days of waiting, I finally contacted her to let her know that her loan had been approved and that the funds would soon be transferred to her account. This news made her very happy, although she couldn't help but wonder about the surprisingly low interest rate of 2% per annum on the loan. I explained that a credit institution is a non-profit philanthropic group dedicated to helping people who, in their opinion, can have a positive impact on society. Although I could easily have offered her the money right away, I understood her pride and knew that she would prefer to get it on credit. Having made great efforts to get her degree, she was determined to succeed on her own terms. As soon as the license was obtained, she wasted no time in purchasing a brand new van, which was artfully converted into a fully functional mobile veterinary office, equipped with all the necessary medical instruments. The news that she had received a license quickly spread around the area, which led to a flood of calls from nearby ranchers who needed her invaluable services. Caitlin and I spent numerous evenings in my modest house, sharing precious moments with each other. Surprisingly, Bill and Colleen seemed to know about our close relationship and expressed no objections or concerns. At that time, she had reached the age when she could make her own choices. The trial of Wilson and his team lasted three months, and the case itself was quite simple. The least influential member of the group decided to cooperate with the prosecution, as a result of which he received a two-year probation period without imprisonment. On the other hand, the other five people who worked under Wilson were each sentenced to five years in prison. As the organizer of the cattle theft, Wilson suffered the most severe punishment, receiving a maximum term of 10 years in prison and a fine of $50,000. After conducting a thorough investigation of his background and the ranch he owns, I found out that he is not married and has no relatives nearby. Moreover, since all of his employees were currently serving time behind bars, there was not a single person capable of overseeing the operation of the ranch. This discovery prompted me to develop a new strategy. But before proceeding with the implementation of my plan, it was necessary to resolve the unresolved issue. To complete the divorce. The mere thought of Janice receiving 50% of my hard-earned possessions was completely unbearable to me. I contacted him again, this time preferring a phone call rather than an email. I asked him to help me talk to Janice and let me know about his desire to offer to settle our divorce. The offer was simple, the payment of $50,000 in exchange for a settlement. I made it clear that if she refused, she would never hear from me again and would not receive any money. At first, she pretended to be innocent and insisted on finding out why I left and why I refused to come back. 
The pretense collapsed when Jake revealed my information about Janice's affair with Brandon and her plans to divorce me. Exposing her deceptive game, Janice, who was still working as a waitress and was experiencing financial difficulties, reluctantly accepted my offer. To move on, I had to return to Texas and hire a lawyer to draft the necessary divorce papers. Caitlin wasn't too happy about the news of my departure, but I assured her that I had to finish this chapter of my life and promised that I would be back soon. At first, I was going to park my car in the long-term parking lot at the airport, but she insisted on accompanying me and being present when I returned. To ease her worries, I left my SUV and most of my belongings, except for what could fit in one suitcase. After flying out on Sunday, I was met by Jake at the airport upon arrival. Throughout my stay with him and his family, I tried to call Caitlin every night to keep her up to date. By Friday, all the necessary paperwork had been organized and settled. Jake escorted Janice to my lawyer's office and assured her that she would be paid $10,000 immediately and the remaining $40 would be paid within 60 days after the divorce process was completed. Janice agreed to the terms, signed the necessary documents, and my lawyer immediately handed her a check for $10,000. Fortunately, I didn't have to directly confront Janice during this process, but it soon dawned on me that I still possessed a significant number of personal belongings, including treasured items inherited from my parents, sentimental souvenirs, and even my old school albums, which were put away in the closet. I decided to rent a moving van and pack all my stuff in it. When I told Caitlin that I wasn't planning on flying back, she was surprised at first. But after I explained that I wanted to bring everything I hold dear, her excitement about my return began to grow. It took me three long days of non-stop driving to cover this distance. Finally, on Tuesday evening, I arrived at the Swinging Bee Ranch, and everyone greeted me with enthusiasm. Throughout the evening, Caitlin continued to provide me with warm hospitality, which made me feel truly welcome. We stayed awake until early morning, completely exhausted, before finally falling asleep. After the initial phase of my plan was successfully completed, I felt ready to proceed with the remaining steps. These included numerous visits to the prison where Wilson was being held as my goal was to convince him to sell his ranch to me. Although he initially resisted my suggestion, I persevered with my arguments. I stressed the fact that he will have to spend at least seven years in prison, and even with good behavior, he will be deprived of the right to parole. If there is no one to look after the ranch, its house and buildings will inevitably deteriorate, and cattle may die due to insufficient care in the winter season. Besides, I was thinking that after sentencing, he might be accepted back into society. When the threat of ruin loomed, he finally agreed to my proposal, giving him the opportunity to start life from scratch after his release. The subsequent task was to obtain financial support, as a result of which I had to transfer my funds back to the country. Janice's determination to keep her $40,000 gave me confidence that she would not risk it hastily. During negotiations with Wilson, I managed to negotiate a price of $5 million for a property that was actually lower than its real value. This made the process of obtaining financing relatively simple. To proceed with the purchase, I made an initial payment of $500,000 and applied for financing for the remaining amount. The whole process took about a month. My actions remained a secret and were known only to Caitlin and Bill to whom I explained that I had personal matters. To solve the problems related to my assets, I devoted part of my time to solving them every week. To ensure more efficient management, I took the initiative to create a corporation and register land in its name. When summer came to an end and autumn came, I decided to hire a professional to clean hay on the site. In addition, I hired four people who were supposed to stay on site and monitor the operation of the ranch during this transition period. The most experienced of them was appointed temporary foreman. Although we were physically close, I tried to make it clear to him that he could always contact me by phone, and I intended to visit the ranch often. As part of my plan, I intended to rebuild the main house, 
a two-story, five-bedroom building that required some modernization. Despite Caitlin's displeasure with my lack of transparency about my endeavors, our relationship continued to flourish. Every day my love for her grew, and I felt that she reciprocated my feelings. Since her veterinary business was booming, she was constantly on the move, but at the same time she remained happy and joyful. In the end, I got to the point where I almost told her my secret. When she returned from inspecting the repairs, she bombarded me with a barrage of questions. Carson, what's going on? Do you have someone else? I hastily replied, Oh my God, no. I promise that there is no one else. It's just that I have personal matters that require my attention. Please trust me. I assure you. I will tell you everything in due time. I beg you to trust me, I assured her. Her gaze bored into me, seeking honesty, and she finally gave up. All right, Carson, I trust you, but I'm waiting for an explanation soon, otherwise there will be consequences. Grabbing her in my arms, I showered her with passionate kisses, pouring out all my affection. With the arrival of spring, the calving season began, and the restoration of the main house came to an end. The moment has come for the implementation of the last stage of my carefully thought-out plan. On a quiet afternoon, when Caitlin was my only companion, I plucked up the courage and invited her for a ride. When we set off, I plucked up the courage and shared with her my thoughts about leaving the Swinging Bee Ranch. At that very moment, her eyes filled with tears, and she expressed her chagrin as she had promised never to leave. Strategically, I decided to lead us to the entrance to the once busy Flying Doll Ranch. Turning onto it, we moved along a secluded road, and I assured her that it was not my intention to go too far. She looked around in confusion, trying to make sense of the situation. Let's explore the neighborhood and find out your opinion about the house. After escorting her upstairs, we went through the bedrooms and then back downstairs. The house had a spacious living room, a tastefully decorated closet, two rooms that served as home offices, and finally, a kitchen. It was obvious from her expression that she was delighted with the newly renovated kitchen. Among the rooms furnished, there was one room reserved for my future office. Curious, I asked her opinion about the house, to which she replied positively, calling it really pleasant. Based on this, I asked if she could imagine living in this room, but I saw that she was becoming more and more confused and worried. Sensing her distress, I modestly knelt down and reached into my jacket pocket. In a cordial tone I informed him that Wilson was no longer the owner of the ranch, instead, it belonged to me. In addition, I expressed my fervent desire for her to become my beloved wife in this house. After asking if this was my house, she waited impatiently for my answer. I nodded, and her excitement turned into a shout of joy. Taking advantage of the moment, I took out my wedding ring from my pocket and held it high, making a sincere offer. A mixture of emotions was reflected on her face. Her features were distorted with surprise, and tears welled up in her eyes. In that brief moment, a doubt flashed through my mind. I was afraid that I had made a mistake. But before I could think about it, she pounced on me, threw me on my back and showered my face with affectionate kisses. At that moment, she held out her finger, silently urging me to put a ring on it, sealing our bond. I carefully examined every detail, looking forward to her return to my arms. With great excitement, she exclaimed, The house is just amazing! I love him! Taking her by the hand, I led her through the room into the hallway, where there were two doors ready to open their purpose. We have two offices here. One is for you so that you can effectively run your business and the other is for me, I explained, earning another passionate kiss. When we entered the office with a large desk, I took out a large piece of paper. The drawing showed a gate leading to the site, on which was written, Double C Ranch. Her curiosity was aroused, and she asked what the name meant. I explained that it was a combination of Carson's and Caitlin's ranch. Tears flowed down her face from the emotions that overwhelmed her, and she clung to my clothes. 
At the moment of mutual desire, we began to undress each other. Gently placing it on the table, we filled the office with our love, marking it with an indescribable bond. Every day our love blossomed more and more, turning into passionate meetings in every corner of our new cherished home. I informed her that it was time to inform her parents, and her joy knew no bounds. It seemed that she was swimming to the truck. By the time we arrived, Bill, Colleen, and Sam were already gathered in the kitchen for dinner. When we entered together, Caitlin proudly raised her left hand and exclaimed, We're getting married! Colleen immediately jumped up and rushed to hug her daughter, and Bill and Sam came up to me with handshakes and pats on the back. After receiving a warm hug from her future mother-in-law, Caitlin began hugging her father and Sam. When the excitement subsided, we gathered around the table to enjoy the meal. Caitlin waited patiently for everyone to start eating, and casually mentioned, By the way, it looks like we're moving. Bill, Colleen, and Sam reacted in unison with surprise, momentarily speechless. Caitlin looked at me, silently urging me to tell her more. Taking a deep breath, I turned to Bill. Do you remember how Wilson proposed combining his ranch with yours? I thought about this idea and found it very promising. Bill, however, burst into anger, strongly stating that he would not allow the flying doll to take over his beloved ranch. I grinned trying to relieve the tension, and assured him that the flying doll was out of the question. Instead, the Double C Ranch is now owned by Caitlin and me, the new owners sitting at his table. Perplexed, Bill asked about my comment, and I told him that I had bought out Wilson and become the owner of the ranch. Colin immediately understood what I meant when I suggested combining the two ranches. I told Bill that we could manage them together and split the profits equally. Fifty. 50. But he noted that my ranch, the Double C Ranch, is more than twice as big as mine and generates significantly more profit. In response, I acknowledged his knowledge and experience in this field and expressed my need for his help. I suggested that we become equal partners and he would take over operations and have the last say in decision making. As the conversation progressed, it became clear that Caitlin's ranch did not belong only to me. It belonged to both Caitlin and me, remaining part of the family. I sat down at the table and looked at Colleen who nodded her decision. Then, reaching across the table the man introduced himself as Danette Carson. We shook hands, sealing the deal. Danette Carson I must admit that this agreement will take some getting used to but I sincerely accept your offer, I said. Thanks to this change, we will have more hands to manage, which means that Sam will become the main supervisor under my leadership. I was happy to remove all the fence posts that I had diligently installed on the other side of the site. My hard work became the subject of everyone's merriment, and that evening we had a lively and joyful celebration. Caitlin and I spent the night together in my cabin, and it exhausted us both. The next morning, we overslept and arrived late for breakfast. But everyone was still in the kitchen, looking forward to eating before heading to the Double C Ranch. Caitlin couldn't wait to show off our new home. I noticed Colin casting envious glances at the newly renovated kitchen. It took Caitlin and her mom a whole month to furnish the house, and finally it was ready for us to move in on our wedding night. Our wedding ceremony took place at the Double C Ranch where Bill and his family were highly respected and loved by the ranchers and their families from all over the area. It was a joyous occasion. Everyone gathered to celebrate our special day. As Bill's son-in-law and the proud new owner of the Double C Ranch, I was warmly welcomed by their society. That evening we went to bed and indulged in passionate intimacy all night and the next day. Although we didn't want to leave, we went on a tropical honeymoon in Fiji on the third day of our marriage. The successful sale of cattle that year brought significant profits, which allowed us to pay off a significant part of the loan. Thanks to Caitlin's thriving business, we were able to lead a comfortable lifestyle. Moreover, we even built a beautiful new house for our beloved Sam. He is now in a relationship with a girl of the same age who lives in the same city. It looks like another wedding is looming on the horizon. Another year passes, 
and my wonderful wife shares with me the most incredible news. She is expecting a baby. We are very glad that we will have a family. Before I finish, I anticipate that some may object that I should have been careful and forced Caitlin to sign a prenup, given my previous experience with Janice. But these people clearly don't understand who Janice really is. She doesn't look like Caitlin. She devotes herself tirelessly to her work, making sure that our house is in order. Her nurturing qualities reflect the influence of her mother, and she constantly showers me with love, and solely for my sake. Every time I look into her captivating blue Irish eyes, I am convinced of the depth of this affection. And as far as I know, Janice never managed to get married again. Apparently, she was too much interested in money than in the feelings of men. She also works as a waiter and lives in a modest apartment in modest solitude. 